The vertebral arteries. Uh, I know we've talked about these before. We've talked about subclavian steel syndrome. We've talked about the basilar artery. We've talked about the circle of Willis. Um, uh, but they do deserve being talked about in their own right. Why are the vertebral arteries so important? Well, there are four arteries supplying blood to the brain and the left and right vertebral arteries are two of them. Makes them very important. Also, it's the vertebral arteries that are gonna supply blood to the brainstem, which makes them even more important because the brainstem is the part of the brain that looks after the running of your body, really. And if the brainstem doesn't work, that's really bad. So let's have a visual look. Should be fairly brief um, at the route the vertebral arteries take in the neck. important idea isn't it we call them the vertebral arteries but they aren't running the whole length of the vertebral column no they're just running with the cervical vertebrae they're running in the neck uh, and we should start off down in the chest so way hello heart ah. from the heart we have the aorta and the arch of the aorta which arches to the left and posteriorly gives off three branches. It gives off the brachiocephalic trunk to the right, brachiocephalic. That's gonna to go to the arm, brachium, cephalic, and the head. Uh, the second branch is the common carotid artery on the left, and the third branch is the subclavian artery on the left. And it's the subclavian arteries that I'm getting to. The brachiocephalic um, trunk will give off the right subclavian artery, and look, Here's the subclavian vein here. There's the subclavian artery posterior to it. This muscle here is one of the scalene muscles. It's the anterior scalene muscle. Here's the first rib. And on either side, the subclavian artery is the part of that artery before it gets to the first rib. Once it passes the lateral border of the first rib, we change its name and call it the axillary artery, and it runs through the axilla, the armpit. And it's the subclavian artery that the vertebral artery comes from on the left and right sides. And it's important that we see that the subclavian artery is deep to that anterior scalene muscle. So the vertebral artery is going to start off from the first part of the subclavian artery. And it's going to be, you know, it's going to be fairly deep. It's going to be deep to, to that anterior scalene muscle and near the deep muscles of the neck. All right. So now, when I switch to a model that's just bones and some nerves and some blood vessels, you know the depth that we're at. So we've taken out the viscera and the muscles. Um, this blood vessel here is the common carotid artery. Uh, this, <laughs> this blood vessel in here, that's that brachiocephalic trunk. So this blood vessel here, this is the subclavian artery. There's the first rib. So this is all subclavian artery and you can see that major branch there. So you can see that it's gonna run superiorly and posteriorly. So essentially it's gonna run from the subclavian artery and we, can, we saw where that was. And then it's gonna to run to the cervical vertebrae. And the cervical vertebrae have got something special here in the transverse process of each cervical vertebrae well, C1 to C6, there is a hole, uh, the transverse foramen, and that foramen is there for the vertebral artery to run through. Here is a single cervical vertebra. There's the spinous process. There's the transverse process. Look, you can see the hole, the transverse foramen, that hole, that is what the vertebral artery is running through. So that's the path that the vertebral artery will take from the subclavian artery to the transverse foramen of the C6 vertebra. And it's gonna run, so it's gonna be uh, between the anterior scalene muscle and the longus collie muscles, essentially. The longus collie muscles are like the deep anterior muscles of the neck. So it goes deep quickly. If you want to know what level that's at. Um, so 
that vertebra there, this is the one I can feel at the level, it's the first lump, the first spinous process that really sticks out. That's C7. So C6 is the one above it. Uh, so the vertebral artery is entering the transverse foramen uh, of the C6 cervical vertebra, and then it ascends in the neck through C5, C4, C3, C2, and C1, at which point it gets to the, the skull. And notice how the vertebral artery is, well, it's very close to the spinal nerves. It's with the bones. It's very close to the spinal cord. It's, it's very, very deep. Also notice how close those vertebrae are together um, and how then, how tight a passage that vertebral artery runs within between the vertebrae. There's, do you know what I mean? There's not a lot, there's no room for it to move around. It is held in place by those bones. We can also see this on this different model. Here is a clear skull. So the bones are clear. And we've got arteries and veins and we've got a brain in there. Um, and again, have a look at where so the yellow things are the spinal nerves. The bone is clear. You can see the vertebral artery. You can see the spinal cord. You can see the carotid arteries, common internal. And you can see the vagus nerve running with them as well. I know there's a lot going on with this model, but hey, that's anatomy for you. But that idea of the vertebral arteries running with the cervical vertebrae from C6 to C1 is very important. And then when we get to C1, it does a bit of a wiggle and gets into the cranial cavity. Let's go back to the other model. So up here, this is the, the occipital bone and the occipital bone has got a big hole in it, the foramen magnum, and that's what the spinal cord runs through and the vertebral arteries will also run through the foramen magnum. So after the vertebral artery passes through the transverse foramen of the C1 vertebra, also known as atlas, that's the name of the, the vertebral bone, because it's holding up the skull. Um, see how it does a little bit of a wiggle. So the artery then runs posteriorly and medially and then superiorly, which is a fancy way of saying it does a bit of a wiggle, and then it runs superiorly up into the foramen magnum, but anteriorly to uh, the medulla oblongata. So the, there's the brainstem forms. The spinal cord becomes the brainstem, which then becomes the brain. Um, and for that, we need to switch to a different model. Um, first of all, though, the brain is surrounded by meninges, layers of connective tissue that support the brain. And there is, uh, there's a connective tissue, a ligament linking the atlas uh, and the occipital bone posteriorly, gets called the posterior atlanto-occipital membrane or ligament. And what we're seeing here is the, the vertebral artery has had to penetrate through that ligament and as it goes through the atlanto-occipital membrane or ligament, and it goes through the dura mater and the arachnoid mater, now it's inside the cranial cavity and it's in the subarachnoid space where we find most of the major vessels, the arteries of the, uh, that are going to supply blood to the brain. So inside the cranial cavity then, the vertebral arteries have now made it inside through the foramen magnum. And we see the left and right vertebral arteries they're running up either side. They are running superiorly, but they're on the anterior surfaces of the medulla oblongata. And then they join at the level of the pons to become the single midline artery, which is called the basilar artery because it's at the base of the skull, the base of the brain. And the basilar artery will then continue to supply blood to the brainstem, to the cerebellum, and it'll end as the two posterior cerebral arteries which are going to supply blood to the posterior cerebrum. So the vertebral arteries are really important, right? So there's the cerebellum. The spinal cord is going down here. This is the medulla oblongata. And this is the pons up here. So 
the vertebral arteries are between the brainstem and the bone here. We are going to talk about the branches and the clinical bits and bobs in a moment. But first of all, since we're looking at the vertebral artery on its own, we can do a little bit more detail. It is described as having four sections, V1, V2, V3, V4. Um, the first section, V1, is the preforaminal part of the vertebral artery. This is running from where the vertebral artery arises from the subclavian artery to the, where it enters the transverse foramen of the C6 vertebra. So that's preforaminal. And then as it runs uh, within the transverse foramina of C6 to C2, that's the foraminal segment, V2. And then V3, the third segment, the Atlantic segment, or the extradural segment, or the extraspinal segment, that is where the vertebral artery is passing through the transverse foramen of C1, uh, the, Atlant the atlas vertebrae, that's what I guess called Atlantic, um, and then does its wiggle. Now I said that it's going to pass through that atlanto-occipital membrane and through the dura mater at some point here to get inside the cranial cavity, right? So as it's passing through the foramen of C1, and before it passes through the dura mater, that is V3, the extradural segment. And then once it's passed through the dura mater, it's now inside the cranial cavity. This is V4, the fourth segment. This is the intradural segment or the intracranial segment. And that continues um, until it becomes the basilar artery. All right, so those are the four segments of the, um, the vertebral artery. Branches of the vertebral arteries, well, as they ascend, they do give off some muscular branches uh, in the neck, but really it's, uh, it's in here. So what do the vertebral arteries supply blood to? Um, upper spinal cord, brainstem, cerebellum, cerebrum, meninges. Okay, so in here then, the they give off the anterior spinal artery, so the left and right vertebral arteries give off branches that combine to give an anterior spinal artery that descends, supplies blood to the spinal cord. They give off a posterior inferior cerebellar artery, pica, uh, and that usually gives off the posterior spinal artery. Um, and they give off meningeal branches as they pass through the meninges, so they supply blood, to, some blood to the connective tissue surrounding the brain, and then of course they become the basilar artery. So those are the branches. So clinically, what are we worried about? Well, the vertebral arteries are supplying blood to the brain stem and the brain. Those are two really important structures. So these are uh, really important arteries. In atherosclerosis, for example, pathology in the vertebral artery can lead to the development of a thrombus, a blood clot, which might reduce the flow of blood through the vertebral artery itself, reducing blood to the structures that it supplies blood to. Um, a fat thrombus might be released and it will flow in the direction of the blood flow. That thrombus, that blood clot, will get stuck in a blood vessel that is too small for it to travel through and will completely occlude that blood vessel. So the region of the brain or the brain stem that was being supplied with blood by that blood vessel is now not receiving blood and will become ischemic. And the posterior cerebral arteries, for example, are supplying blood to deep structures in the brain, like the thalamus and the posterior cerebrum. So that can have a big effect on function. These can be life-changing events and can lead to death. Um, vertebral artery dissection. So in, with dissection of an artery, we're talking about the lining inside the artery is torn. Um, maybe the artery is stretched or twisted in some way. The lining is torn, that again might cause a bit of a flap that occludes part of the artery, reduces the amount of blood able to flow through the artery, and that will also alter flow, can lead to the development of a thrombus, a blood clot, which again, we're talking about stroke here, can lead to a region of the brain becoming ischemic. So 
those are dangerous events. The, the vertebral artery then might be injured through trauma. So when we have neck injuries, we worry about the vertebral artery. And of course, if you cause something like, if something like a, um, a vertebral artery dissection has happened, the signs and symptoms might not be immediate. They might be later because that clot is gonna form later, it's gonna get dislodged later. So this is not at the traumatic event, but after the traumatic event many, many, many times. Also, of course, the neck is an area that's targeted for manipulation to relieve aches and pains, but any manipulation of the neck carries a risk of damaging the vertebral artery. It is tightly held within the cervical vertebrae. Uh, there are plenty of case studies of people that have developed, uh, well, they, you know, they've been injured or killed by damage to the vertebral artery because of manipulation to the neck. Um, whenever we do, uh, whenever healthcare professionals do procedures on patients, this needs to be done with informed consent. The patient needs to understand what is going to be done and what the risks of that are so that the patient themselves can decide what they want to be done. It is the patient's decision, not the healthcare provider's decision, right? And permanent disability or death are pretty significant side effects. So it's something the patient should be made aware of. So this anatomy in a condensed form and the risks thereof need to be described um, to the patient. Although I don't think anybody's actually agreed on exactly what the risk is in terms of numbers, but there is a risk there. Anyway, that's the anatomy of the vertebral artery. There's a left one, there's a right one. They're really important. Along with the internal carotid arteries, they supply the blood to the brain. The rest of the body is kind of a vehicle just for this bit up here. So that's the anatomy of the vertebral arteries. Enough waffling from me. See you uh, next week. Mm -hmm.